Welcome to Longevity Industries presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I, of course, am your host, Dean Phillips. And our special thanks to our sponsors, localenterprise.com. That's enterprise with a Z. Home of the Cody Bot, a robot for sanitizing, disinfecting, and temperature measurement for your employees. And with this time of COVID wreaking its head again back in our society, it's uh, another one of those things we really need to keep on top of. And the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation. We like to thank them as well for supporting the show. With me today, I have with me Tim Fabian. He comes to us from Shape Technologies, the leader in water jet technologies. And I'd like to welcome him. He is the VP of Marketing and Product Management. Welcome, Tim. Hi, Dean. How are you? Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you here, sir. Uh, right off the bat, tell us your big takeaway. What are we going to be looking at five years from now? Well, Dean, interesting. You you led the show talking a little bit about how COVID turned its uh, head here again, and and I think uh, the last twelve months has uh, has changed the manufacturing industry, right? Some of the lessons and and hard lessons, frankly, that we've learned over the last twelve months are going to do a fair amount, I think, to shape that next five years and. Uh, if I look at what, and I think any company needs to look uh, at what what's keeping manufacturers awake at night right now. Uh, historically, we might have said, "Oh, it's, let's figure out how to cut that part a little faster or a little bit more accurate." Or, uh, but frankly, what's keeping uh, manufacturers awake at night today is, is how do I meet my customer commitments, and how do I fill those holes in my supply chain, and how do I hire and and train new workers, right? So what you're going to see, I think, in the next five years are going to be manufacturers saying, boy, these problems I really have to solve because I don't want to be in that in that spot again. And uh, and I think there's a number of things that could be done to, to, to fill those, right? Uh, automation, sure, you hear a lot about that, and it's, it's, uh, it's fairly cliche, I think, these days. Uh, but really, it's uh, it's not just automation that customers want. That's a, that's a solution. It's really uptime and reliability that they're after. And automation is one possible solution uh, to that. Uh, I do think you're going to see uh, manufacturers uh, doing more in-house manufacturing and insourcing. I think, uh, candidly, uh, a lot of organizations uh, have realized that maybe we overplayed our hand a little bit in the just-in-time manufacturing concept that uh, mm-hmm. has sort of taken hold of the manufacturing industry over the last couple decades, and, and I think folks paid the price for that uh, a little bit. So I think you'll see some insourcing, and then uh, 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 in addition to that, I, I really think the connected machines and IoT world uh, it's a little bit difficult for people to understand how that's going to help uh, fill in holes in supply chain and hire and train workers and meet customer commitments. But really, there are a lot of really neat things that you can do uh, with IoT and connected machines that, that I think will help manufacturers. And I think that we've hit a little bit of an inflection point where uh, – manufacturers are going to begin to see some of the value that can be derived from that. And I think you're going to see a, an acceleration of how that technology is, uh, is embraced. And it's been around a while, but I think you're going to really see it uh, take off. I think it's a little bit of uh, perhaps now you're really starting to see electric cars take off, right? You knew that they were around four or five years ago, but I think uh, you're going to see things ramp up considerably from a, from an IOT and connected world machine standpoint as well, Dean. Right. It, it, it's interesting you mentioned that about just-in-time strategies. I would have thought that a lot of the marketplace would have learned from the tsunami incident in Japan years ago, which they said, oh, even then they were saying, we, we need to diversify our supply chain. We need to look at making sure that we have multiple locations so that this doesn't happen. But then we seem to have fallen back into that same habit. I'm sure it's easier to manage a supply chain with just one supplier, <laughs> but I think at times that yeah. it, it comes back to bite you when you're like, man, 
these kinds of incidents that happen of we really are so dependent on this, whether it's just the actual product itself or the raw materials or the transportation of those materials, we don't realize how really tentative the, that that is when we actually look at it. What what do, what do you think are some of the, the challenges within that to get us to actually do something about it? It's one thing that we talk about it, but how do we get there? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a great question, right? And and, uh, and and to your point about the tsunami, right? Folks have uh, just, uh, taken their supply chains and they've diversified them across the uh, different uh, different providers. And now, unfortunately, multiple people are seeing uh, similar issues. But I think mm-hmm. there are some steps that can be taken um, from the perspective of insourcing and bringing in uh, your own internal manufacturing. A lot of companies outsource things that are intimidating to them. Uh, maybe things that aren't traditionally in their wheelhouse or something that requires a special process. And I think you're going to see, especially where that supply chain is frail and critical, I think you're going to see companies begin to keep a, a more open mind about taking some of that in, in-house. Uh, I think they're looking for, uh, in our cases, uh, and I could speak from personal experience here working for a machine tool manufacturer, they're relying a lot more on uh, companies to not just provide a piece of equipment, but a solution. Uh, they don't want to just buy uh, something you plug in and have to figure out how to program. They want something turnkey. Uh, they want to be trained and shown how to how to do it. They want it producing good parts before the the technician is done installing the machine. So that perspective has has changed quite a bit. But I think they need those systems to be uh, to be flexible as well. Uh, so. Uh, so that they can adapt with uh, new technology, new orders, new product uh, requirements coming in from from their customers. So uh, that that's one thing uh, I think. And, and again, I, I think you're going to see a uh, an in an insourcing of 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 more uh, more of that. If people, uh, especially here in the United States, right? There's a little bit of a chip of self reliance that you have on manufacturers and. And, and, and the, I think the first reaction is when you've been bitten, uh, manufacturers say, well, fine, I'm going to do it myself then since I can't rely on somebody else to do it. And that impetus I think is what'll, what'll be, what'll be driving that. So it's, uh, it's interesting that you, you say that because I think that's a challenge that many companies face is not only to understand what happened, uh, but the root causes of, of what's happened because of that. Once you disrupt a, a supply chain for basically across all industries for several months, it is really tough to get back to making up for two months of lost production. Sure. And, and right now, uh, the point I made earlier, right, what's keeping people up at night is meeting their customer commitment because mm-hmm. uh, if you can't hit your customer commitment. That means that they're shopping out at your competitor, uh, the next county over or state over. Uh, and if you happen to be somebody who has your business and, and your manufacturing capability set up in a position, uh, you could be reaping an incredible harvest of, of new customers right now that have no other solution, but you to get work done. So, uh, so from the, you know, and that's from a job shop perspective. Uh, but even, even too, uh, you've got, let's just say you're an OEM of, 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 a, of a widget out there. Well, if company A can't produce widgets to satisfy the market and company B can, company B is going to win market share. Yeah, so. that's absolutely true. So tell me how, tell me about your background and how you got involved in, manufacturing and what was your passion like to get you into this? Oh, uh, Dean, well, a lot of luck to be candid with you. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so I was the, uh, the first in my first in my family to go off to college. Uh, my dad was a tool and die maker. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom was the uh, actually the foreman at a gear hobbing department of an electric motor mani- uh, manufacturer. So metalworking was in in my family blood. And uh, I remember my dad telling me, I don't want you to do what I do when I grow up. And interestingly, I went off to college and it was my summer job. And I, I hid the fact from him that I really enjoyed working with metal. <laughs> so, uh, so, but ultimately after college, uh, I happened to get into the right industry. Uh, I did a tool and die apprenticeship. I completed a tool and die apprenticeship, but also went, uh, went, uh, went to college and uh, went to work in the mid nineties, uh, essentially early in the, in the days of water jet technology, uh, training people how to run water jet machines, uh, doing technical support. I wore a lot of hats, uh, did product demonstrations, software help, phone support, uh, I'd pack up the UPS truck with parts at the end of the day. And this is when there were just a few water jets here and there. Uh, they really weren't adopted yet, but uh, I got really lucky that I got into the, a, a great industry that has grown a hundredfold since then. And frankly, just worked my way up through the organization from, uh, from doing that role that I just explained to working in a sales role, to working in product management, to overseeing our service department at times, to now uh, in charge of our product strategy and marketing for all of the shape portfolio of companies. So uh, really was very fortunate to, um, be able to work in the manufacturing environment. It's something that I love. I love going out and seeing how things are made. And uh, again, very, very fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah. But I I think it also gives you a very good perspective when you've taken that type of a route into your current role is by having the experience of done other things as you go along. I've, done this i've done these jobs and the thing that always seems to stick out to me about most people in manufacturing and specifically in machine tool business is that there's this constant thought process of how do i improve this how do we come up with new ideas how do we take this technology to another level and how do we continue to build things in the u.s I think that's a a commonality that you see, especially when you go to shows like Fabtech, which is coming up shortly, mm-hmm. is everybody there seems to have the same objective in some way, shape, or form of how do we improve this? How do we make this widget better? How do we come up with a new solution and a new solution strategy, which I think is one of the areas kind of, as you touched on, is a challenge now uh, of what does that solution look like? It's not just a product. It's a solution. How, how does that help people? Now, for instance, is, is Flow, for example, let's just take a company, are they looking at in similar ways to make things easier for the operator to, uh, to be able to create a part? make it easier Mm -hmm. is is that something that you see happening now that uh, is needed because of a shortage of workforce absolutely um so the and and to answer your question right we're not going to learn how to improve these things by sitting in cubicles right we've got to get out and see how people are using their machines see the pain point see the, the grimace on their face when they're stuck programming a machine uh, and, and just, it's no secret, right. That we're having difficulty attracting people into this industry. Uh, and, and that's something I'm really passionate about and spent a lot of time talking to kids at schools about getting involved in the manufacturing, uh, technology. Uh, but, but what we've had to do is we've had to make, of course, the programming, uh, simpler in, in the systems. We've had to take uh, the, the expert out of the 30 year G code programmer that we might've seen in the industry 20 years ago mm-hmm. and put it in a computer, uh, that a, a kid growing up, uh, playing on an iPad, 
I might be comfortable with. Okay. So, uh, and this is where we can get into a little bit of the connected machine and benefits of the IOT technology. There are some things that we can do now where we can, uh, if, if, if we have a, as a manufacturer understand the most optimal way to run your water jet machine, uh, and, and we're connected to that machine, we might be able to gain insights when your operator isn't running that machine in the most effective manner as possible. Okay. And, uh, there might be instances now where we can, uh, program the machine to, uh, see that and say, and pop up an alarm and say, you can save 12% if you change X and Y and Z on your program. Okay. Uh, or we can also give insights, uh, for example, to a shop owner that says, uh, Hey, your, your second shift operator, uh, is generally producing 18% less than your first shift operator. And, and not only that, but here's why, and, and here's some suggestions to improve that. Uh, and we recommend this online training course for them and click this link and here it is. So there's a lot of things that, that we have to do. We have to make it easier. Uh, and this is, again, this is to the point where, uh, where I think the OEMs and machine tool manufacturers have a lot to offer uh, manufacturers because uh, we, we're not attracting, there's, there's no people with 30 years of experience, new people coming into the industry, right? No, so we, right. we, we've, we've got to be able to take these, 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 this next generation and get them ramped up quickly because, uh, you know, we need parts produced yesterday. <laughs> so, right. And I think that, I think you kind of touched on it. There is how do we make it more attractive for them to, to come into this industry? And one of the problems I see is that is things like the interfaces is the feedback from IOT because even a kid who's just out of high school who comes into a plant can look at it and say, this makes no sense. Why don't you have a button here that I just press that does this? You know, they can look at a computer and say, this, this, the flow within this procedure, just, it doesn't make any sense because that's what they've done their whole lives. They've been Mm -hmm. playing with this, this stuff and their level of tolerance for a poorly desi- designed interface is pretty low because <laughs> they've they've had their whole lives they've they've never spent one day without something like a google mm-hmm. um, they they haven't spent any time where this interface wasn't at their fingertips whereas when i started in the business you know if i wanted to get on a computer there was this c in a blinking line, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's, that, right. that's, that's how it was when, when I started. So I don't, I don't have the problem with, okay, if I have to do this, it's not a big deal, but for them, they're like, why is there no, uh, graphic user interface? Why is there no button here? I could just do, why do I have to go into this and, and do these things? And why isn't this information pulled out of this program and put into this one? And they're all very, very valid questions. What what kinds of things do you see coming that help to make that more user friendly for people and get them interested, get them excited, so that there's more visual communications? Yeah, Dean, all great points, right? And uh, and it's it's interesting you you, you mentioned this, right? So. Uh, I enjoy going out and talking to those people because I think you actually gain more insights on how your products need to change by talking to those folks than you do talking to the 30 or 40 year veteran. Okay. Uh, We tend to have biases in the industry. I've been in the industry 25 years. So I I, I tend to think a little bit more uh, traditionally like the old school guys. So you try to get with some of these younger and I'll call them kids, but they're not kids, right? These are people, you know, 30 years, 25 years old. Uh, and, and, and you got to learn how they learn and, and, and the way that they learn is very, uh, very visual. 
uh, and and it is uh, it is not in a in a even you know in the in the past right we if you remember back in the days of CNC controls we went from G code and then we went into conversational code okay mm-hmm. we thought boy conversational code what a great improvement this is it just makes so much more sense. Well, conversational code is like a foreign language to the, to the newer people coming into the industry. They want something very visual, something very graphic. They want a flow of an interface and a pull down menu that, that makes sense to the way that they currently use. And, and we spent a lot of time talking to these folks and getting uh, their feedback. And, and you just got to build a system that, that, that learns the way they learn. Uh, uh, there's some pretty doggone complicated apps and things out there that that these uh, that these younger generation could pick up of uh, individuals. They can pick up pretty quick and be proficient in it in a day or two, and mm-hmm. play a game with their friend. Okay, and we need to take that same logic and say, okay, if you could pick that app up and learn how to play uh, a game with your friend across the country. Now let's take that same methodology and learn how to produce a top quality, highly accurate part uh, with the optimal cycle time. And, and our challenge is to do just that uh, and, and to make it enjoyable for them. Um, like anything, uh, it's a very grassroots effort. I think, you, I think the biggest thing is to just get people exposed to it. That, that's the number one thing. I, I really believe that if you can just let them see it, experience, do it, touch it, and feel it, you'll get a lot of kids and younger generation involved in manufacturing. Uh, and, and part of my concern is, is when I see schools cutting these programs out, I think you, you really miss an opportunity to, to attract uh, some, of the, uh, some of that generation uh, in. Uh, Interestingly, just a, a, a side comment that I'll make too. I do think that to a, a little bit of a lesser extent, but I, I've seen this happen where you see some of the old shows on Discovery Channel, the Orange County Choppers type shows and, and mm-hmm. things. I'd like to see more of those shows and the How It's Made shows. I'd like to see more of that on television because uh, I've spent some time talking to uh, fabricator uh fabrication programs at community colleges and a number of them have told me over the years that that those shows did quite a bit to attract people into learning how to weld and how to machine and manufacture uh because of of, of the exposure that that the that the kids have had on on television of seeing some of that so uh i'd like to see an increase in some of that and 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 uh and you're seeing some good youtube channels um, that are out there. We have a, a partner with a company called the water jet channel where they do some neat, uh, neat things and, and that show people how things are made. And interestingly, my son's 14 years old and, uh, he asked me, uh, a few weeks ago, he goes, Ted, have you ever heard of the water jet channel? And I said, Oh yeah, we, we work with those guys, uh, a lot. He goes, Oh, well they made this neat part. And, this wasn't me soliciting my son. This wasn't me telling him to go click on it, but he found it, right? So that uh, that's encouraging for me when I when I hear and see some of that. So the more participation and the more uh, we can get things on whatever, whatever that channel, is, that venue is, or that that media of preference, be it YouTube or Discover uh, Discovery Channel, whatever it is, I'd like to see more of that in addition to the grassroots just efforts in the community colleges to do exposing kids. That stuff. No. If if anybody remembers the, there used to be a game called uh, Roller Coaster Tycoon, and you built a roller coaster, and basically you built an amusement park and you ran it. I always thought that it would be interesting to program a game where you ran a manufacturing facility, and maybe you chose one path or a different path on how you were going to make something, and it was either successful or wasn't successful, but you learned something along the way that would help you in understanding the process, which is, I think in many cases, a greater benefit to where you actually learn something that can help you. I see a lot of 
younger people, when I visit schools, mostly I'm dealing with engineers. So they have a lot of that process in their minds. But Mm -hmm. some other kids, I think it's more difficult because they haven't been exposed to that methodology or that thinking process. Of course, you'd have to make it interesting enough that uh, it was more uh, uh, more levels of gamification where it's something that kids want to engage with and even engineers want to engage with. But it has to, I think in many cases, we have to find ways to use that strategy of coming up with ways. You mentioned about that learn how they learn. And part of that is, I think, involved in artificial intelligence. Do you see more of that coming into play? Because you mentioned how there's people are, hey, how come you did it this way? How come you did this process in this manner? Do you see more of that kind of getting tied into your your systems and, and systems in general? Absolutely. Absolutely. The and I even tell my kids, too, hey, if, if you want to get into a really exciting field that's uh, going to have a, a great career path in the next 50 years, you should look into AI. And I really do believe that. Uh, but it, is, it relates to AI. Uh, and this is why it's important to get machines connected, right? Because the foundation of AI is building algorithms that, uh, that, can, uh, that can learn. It could learn mm-hmm. about machine failures before they happen to alert a shop owner when they're going to have a disruption in that, in that supply chain, uh, or their, or rather their production schedule. Uh, it, it will, uh, learn where, uh, even pick up things like, uh, when, uh, a person's drawing a, uh, a part, maybe in a CAD system that they click on the help file most often on this feature at this point in a drawing. And then it, it gives the manufacturer insight to change that. Okay. Uh, it, there's just so many incredible things that it can, it can do. But again, the, the, the key to this is getting the data to begin building these algorithms. And, and that's sort of the place where a lot of manufacturers are right now is, is we don't have a lot of artificial intelligence or predictive uh, components in the machine tools yet, but we're beginning to collect the data points that are necessary to build the, the confidence tables and the algorithms to, to be able to uh, create artificial intelligence in there. And uh, when I was talking a little bit about IOT and connected machines, we've had a little bit of an inflection point, I think, uh, where we've gone to the point where I think a lot of manufacturers are historically maybe a little bit nervous about connecting their machine to the Internet or sharing information. Uh, uh, but, but, what they, but once they see the value, right, that can, that can be garnered from that, uh, I think that that's going to help help change that. And I think the industry is is maybe where the rest of the world is, maybe where you or I were, Dean, in, in 1998. Uh, if you think about the nervousness the first time we ever have ever had to enter our credit card number into a computer sure. to purchase something. Mm-hmm. And, and folks were a little nervous. This is new technology. Is my bank account going to be drained tomorrow, right? And you're seeing manufacturers a little bit nervous uh, about uh, hooking hooking their machines uh, hooking their machines up onto the internet to be able to to begin uh, helping that data transform their business. But once they begin seeing the value out of it, just as you or I did when we began uh, getting two day deliveries on lots of items, mm-hmm. uh, they're going to to really increase the adoption rate of that technology, and it's going to greatly accelerate the artificial intelligence and the learning you can get when, uh, in the case of somewhere, for example, like shape technologies or flow, we have 20, uh, ultra high pressure pumps, uh, in our, in our lab. And, and it might take a hundred years of data to compile some tests. But if we can have access to 20,000 pumps of our installed base, uh, we can make product improvements, uh, you know, maybe in weeks. So, so there's there's a lot of benefit that could be uh, could be gained from that. It's a great point. 
Tim, thank you so much. We're just about out of time here, and I really do appreciate you taking the time with us today. Tell people how they can reach you. Uh, it, Dean, it was a, first of all, it was a real pleasure. I'd encourage uh, people to go, uh, if you want to learn more about water jet technology, uh, go to shapetechnologies.com or pick any of our partner companies, uh, whether it be Flow or KMT or H2O Jet, we'll help you out. And send me an email at tfabian at shapetechnologies.com, and I'll be happy to answer any more questions for folks. So, Excellent. Thank you, Dean. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you for being here. Go out and make it a great day. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.